Right. Um, hi, Mark. Hi, Scott. Um, big technical issue to begin the day, but uh, I think we are live now. Um, so let's continue with our conversation. Okay. Um, so um, let's begin the session. Mark and Scott, uh, can we begin by you guys introducing yourself first? Uh, Mark, you can go first. Uh, sure. So my name is Mark Borstein. I'm the uh, CTO of Tremo Security. Uh, been working with Scott now for mm, three years, four years, about yeah. that. I think it was KubeCon 2017 when we first started chatting. Yeah, it's um, time flies, right? So. Time flies, yeah. Um, and uh, background uh, started off in identity management. So I've been doing uh, identity management for 20 plus years at this point. Uh, and applications programming, consulting, infrastructure, operations, and then got into Kubernetes uh, about when Kube 1.3 came out, about when RBAC came out, um, and uh, have been active in the community ever since. Cool. Great. Scott, I think you can take over. Great. Uh, so I'm Scott Sorovich. I actually work for HSBC Bank uh, in the US. I am the Global Container Engineering Lead. Uh, also the product owner for the on-prem Kubernetes infrastructure that HSBC, again, uses globally. Uh, so I've been in Kubernetes uh, for about four to five years, production side in about three. Uh, about four years ago is when the, we started looking at it from a, an organizational view, which uh, is what ultimately led me to uh, kind of meeting Mark out of the blue from a podcast. And, and then from there, you know, we just got into some conversations that we geeked out with Kubernetes. That's where it started. And then, of course, you find out you have lots of things in common, like Star Wars, 3D printing, just geek stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, we, we, my team owns everything internal in the ecosystem. So it's not just Kubernetes, and it's also cloud stuff. Cool. Um, good to know. Um, so, Mark and Scott, um, let's start talking a bit about um, your book, the second edition of Kubernetes and Enterprise Guide. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the book and who is it for? Sure. So uh, the book is really for folks that want a little bit more of an advanced look on Kubernetes. Um, what we didn't want to do is create a, a another book that kind of walks you through the basics of Kubernetes of, you know, deployments and, and getting objects up and running. What we really wanted to do was focus on some of the more advanced use cases and specifically um, the difference between deploying Kubernetes inside of an enterprise versus deploying Kubernetes inside of a, a large service provider. You know, we, we always talk about the, the Googles, the Ubers, um, you know, the, these massive service providers that, you know, scale to millions. Uh, but then you start talking about your typical enterprise where you might have hundreds, maybe even thousands of applications with just a couple hundred users each. And what are the impacts going to be on that? Um, what are the impacts on security? What are the impacts on compliance? What are the impacts on organization management? Uh, and, and so uh, we wanted to, to talk to the technology that would impact enterprises um, when we got into how we actually did our implementations. Yep, yep. <clears throat> so like Mark was saying on that, uh, we, 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 being in the community so long and just knowing from the other enterprises that, you know, where I work or people I speak to, uh, we, we started to hear about some of the misconceptions or misunderstood objects or how people were deploying uh, certain uh, configurations. So we sat out on the first edition because we saw a lot of people didn't know how to integrate an OIDC. Or I would always hear from people, Kubernetes dashboard is insecure, never deploy it. And we just kind of look and go, that's not true. We, we know things happen like Tesla, where that happened, and that got that reputation. But you can deploy it uh, correctly. And it's one of the most used um, resources inside the bank where I am. People love to look at that for the fast graphs, the logs. So we wanted to kind of squash out some of these misconceptions uh, and explain to people, uh, as Mark said, no reason to go back to rehash the beginning. So there's other books like Kubernetes Up and Running and, and a lot of books that get you into the resources. But we wanted to get more into um, how you're going to deploy it, secure it, uh, and things that often people thought is a day two event like runtime security with Falco, not a day two event. If that's a day two thing, you've got problems between day one and two where you've got some potential security problems. So 
uh, we, we had some great reception in the first edition, uh, which led us to take that time on the second edition. And, and we're both passionate about teaching in general, whether it's presentations at KubeCon, Google Next, uh, anywhere. We just like to, to talk cloud Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great to know. Um, so, Mark and Scott, in your opinion, um, why is Kubernetes becoming so widely adopted? So we're starting with the uh, easy questions. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, my own personal opinion is, is it, it it balances that right. It, it has that right balance between complex enough to do the job, but simple enough for mere mortals to pick up quickly. Um, you know, I, 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 before I got into Kubernetes, I was starting to get into OpenStack. And man, getting into OpenStack you needed uh, 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 you know, a few pieces of hardware at least, or at least a really beefy piece of hardware. You needed a lot of, of, of understanding of storage and, and whatnot to, to just get the thing up and running. Whereas with Kubernetes, it was much lighter weight. Um, it's still very complex, don't get me wrong, but the complexity can kind of grow with you as you do more. You can start with, hey, here's a VM I can get it up and running. I don't really understand what the heck's going on underneath, but, oh, I got a web server. Oh, I can access this. And then as I want to do more and more complex things, the API grows with you in what you're able to accomplish. Um, so, okay, I, need, I, now need, I know now how to mount something into my container, or, okay, now I'm going to start calling the API, or now I'm going to start calling external services, service, you know, and, and start layering on. So it's not simple by any stretch of the imagination, um, but there is, a there, there is a simplicity to it that I don't think existed in other data center style APIs. Um, and, and I think that that's a big reason. Uh, uh, the other thing I would say is just community. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that there was so much collaboration between the large vendors up front, um, the, you know, the, there was so many great, um, uh, uh, you know, the, it was always just a very open, very, we want to make this a welcome place for people to come and talk and, and work and deal and, and build um, that you, you kind of put all those things together and, and, you know, psh. yeah. And from my, my view, like Mark was saying, uh, same thing. It's, it, it is a complex system, right? And we say this in one of the chapters for Istio, especially where we say, yeah, it's complex on the back end. So you got to configure it. Your operators have to know what they're doing, their admins, whatever you want to call the cluster management people. But once it's deployed, it, it's fairly simple for developers to be empowered to go do whatever they need to do. Like in our example, we do namespace as a service is what we call it. And you're going to get your namespace and hopefully that happens quickly or if not straight through. And from that, you can deploy everything. So of course, as a lot of people on this call would know that, uh, you get your ingress rules, you can set up your security. Uh, you try to do this in the heritage days, you gotta submit your DNS request. You gotta get your own certificate. It just makes it uh, quicker, easier. And of course, what people like to hear is it saves money. Uh, mm -hmm. Or it, it can, depending on what you're doing. Uh, what I did it, as an example was uh, I took a piece of hardware and I did VMware and put a bunch of MySQL on it, maxed it out, did some test workloads. Uh, wiped that machine, did it with containers. And I actually got about 60% more density off of that server. So, you know, if you take a gross assumption and say, wow, 60% savings across the board, that's something that CIOs, CEOs like to hear, right? I mean, the added effect is you get the agility. But we all know not everybody looks at what the feature set is first. They look at what the cost is going to be. Then the feature set's cool. It's not the way to look at it. It should be feature set cost as an added bonus if you can save. But in the case mm -hmm. of Kubernetes, you kind of get both out of the box. I mean, your savings might not be 60%, but heck, if it's five or 10%, it's better than nothing, especially at scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Scott and Mark, for sharing these insights. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to my next question. Um, so at PACT, obviously, as you guys would know as authors, um, one of our core purposes is upskilling people. 
um, there's a lot of uh, career advancements uh, that happen even in case of experienced uh, people in the industry. Um, so now considering the audience of the book, um, so what do you think DevOps engineers, developers or system administrators should basically do to enhance their IT career paths? Um, or in other words, what do you think are the some of the most valuable skills for these professionals? Um, so, you know, the, Scott and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, besides buying our book, um, you know, the, the biggest thing you can do is just tinker and play and be curious and break things um, and ask a lot of questions like that. That's those things are going to get you so much farther in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, the, 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 there's no such thing as too much knowledge. Um, you know, so wh whether you're reading our book, you're reading someone else's book, you're reading a blog post. I'd be a little careful about blog posts only because there are a lot of really terrible ones out there, um, that give really bad advice. Uh, but you know, just tinkering, break things, you know, oh, I, I, you know, I know how to deploy a database. Like I, I was reading somebody on Reddit yesterday who was like, yeah, I'm in storage and I want to get into, um, I want to get into this, this Kubernetes space, you know, do I have the right skills? Yes. Right. But it, it's also, you know, well, okay. Storage is something that's hard to do in Kubernetes. So that's easy starting point, but even just, you know, Get the cluster up and running, launch it, hit a few buttons, break it, tear it down, build it back up, see what happens. Um, yeah, the, the, this is a great space to be curious in because there's always something new to learn. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, this, this is something like Mark said that we've talked about a lot. First of all, it's a question we get from outside people. So we'll get contacts in LinkedIn. I won't mention companies, but they'll say, how do we, how do we find people? And I have this problem. I, I, I need people uh, and, and I need to get that skill set. Unfortunately, what we do tend to run into is a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge on the CSP side where you can click a button and you get a Kubernetes cluster, which means you've never seen the control plane, especially on those providers. And you really should know about the control plane before even deploying applications. So you at least understand how Kubernetes does certain things. You don't have to be an expert in it if you're going to be a developer or a consumer. But the skill sets, obviously, like Mark said, for CKA and CKS and CCAD as well, you know, you get those letters. Um, it, it doesn't mean you know it all, right? But it does show uh, that the efforts there, especially the CKS, it, that's a very complex exam. Uh, and then CKA, yeah. again, is still a good one. Um, and we get a lot of communications from people in LinkedIn that it said, you know, I took the CKA, your book helped a lot. We didn't write it for that, not, not even close wasn't even consideration when we did it we the topics are there but we don't gear it to that because we gear it to knowing what a network policy would be or what psps will be or how you can do this or using the valero um and mark said it right it, crashing is the best thing so people will ask me how do i get into containers and, and they'll spin up a cluster like mark said and you run an nginx container and you see welcome to nginx and you go awesome now what it's tough, right? You got to force yourself to use it. In my case, what I did, I had a lot of virtual machines that actually ran my home automation. So about four years ago to force myself into it, I converted them all to containers and turned off my, my VMware for that side. And the reason I did that was, as people can imagine on this, um, if my lights don't turn on, my wife probably won't be happy. <laughs> so how do I force myself to make sure these containers are up, running, scaled, monitored, I, I had Prometheus, I had it alerting me. I had a private Slack channel even that we would send the alerts to, to say, you know what, home assistance down. That's just mm -hmm. one of the containers I have, or this API is down. So you, you force yourself into supporting your own. You know, you can always deploy WordPress. You can always, you know, all the examples are great to start with, but starting to figure out what you could use is really helpful. And in this space, you can't get comfortable as Mark and I know, I learn something new every day. I mean, you know, people might look and go, well, they've written a book, they've done this, they do presentations, they must know everything. And of course, nobody does. And there's things we never see. There's a lot of objects in Kubernetes. And uh, that's what makes it fun for me. And I know for Mark, we'll be texting each other and go, 
have you ever seen this problem? I'm like, no, but now I'm interested <laughs> because that's when you learn or people will ask me, how did you know to go to look at that log? Yeah. You, you don't, you, you've learned that from troubleshooting. And yeah, like Mark said, um, be, be a geek. It never stops, right? Kubernetes every four months now. You, you have to, and that's just Kubernetes. What about the ancillary components or the add-ons, you know, Nginx, Falco upgrades, Knative, Istio. You know, mm -hmm. the life cycle management of a cluster gets complex. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. Um, we have a question from Charles Morin, so we'll take that for now. Um, so he's asking, what if your workloads are not quite stateful? and or a primary purpose is self-healing, resiliency. Does it make sense to move from VMs to containers? What questions should we be asking? That's a great question. Um, and this is, a, this is one that's pretty common is, you know, well, oh, we're not a microservice, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't go to containers or, um, and, you know, the, the benefits you know, so first I would say, take a step back and figure out what are you trying to accomplish? Um, if you're trying to accomplish, I want to use containers because it looks cool. Okay, there's a time and place for that. I'm not going to lie. But, you know, that that shouldn't really be your goal. Um, you know, the, there should be a, a a business goal that you're looking to obtain or a mission goal. If, if you're in government, I always say mission um, and work backwards from there. So uh, as an example, um one of my first attempts at containerizing uh, a system, which ended in spectacular failure, by the way, uh, was a, 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 an identity system that I managed for a customer where um, we just, we needed higher density. Like we, we getting hardware was painful and we just wanted to try and get higher density. And, and this was pre Kubernetes. This is when, you know, there was still a question of Kubernetes or swarm or do it yourself or whatever for orchestration. Um, and we just, we took every wrong approach possible. Um, you know, we, we tried to treat uh, containers as VMs, which does not work. We tried to, um, uh, we, we tried to use volumes for configuration management. Um, that, that's kind of painful too. Um, and so we, we were trying to do it uh, uh, necessarily for the wrong reasons. Um, and, and it ultimately failed. Uh, however, the same thing succeeded a few years later when we did, and we did move to Kubernetes because he said, we said, okay, we've got a really clear goal as to what we want to do. Uh, these were not microservices. These were stateful systems. And we said, you know, we, we really want to make sure that our workloads, um, have uptime. We're monitoring them, right? So like using something like Prometheus became a big deal because we didn't want to just make sure that the system was running as a whole. We want to be able to do like synthetic transactions and checking those things. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to do uh, quick rollbacks. The nice thing about container, it doesn't work. Okay, go to the last one. Um, so, so there were definitely benefits to going to containers uh, outside of um, you know, kind of that Ching Rua. What what I would definitely recommend against is the. Um, you know, I'm originally from Massachusetts. I call it a big dig project. Um, avoid the idea that um, you know you have to do everything before you do something. Like don't don't you know don't look at. I, I once had a conversation with someone when when operators were first hitting the scene. They were the hottest things ever, and they said you know. Well, what's the point of deploying if it's not an operator? I was like, operators have been around for like 30 seconds. You know, this was a few years ago, but at the time it was like, you don't have to have an operator. You know, there are people who are going to say, well, what's the point of doing Kubernetes if you don't do GitOps? What's the point of doing Kubernetes if you don't, you know, X, Y, Z? Um, so, you know, it's a, don't get so intimidated by what Shangri-La looks like and the perfect infrastructure looks like. Figure out what are those key benefits that you're looking for and if Kubernetes will give that to you. Yes, low-hanging fruit. Absolutely 100% that is the best way to start. Um, you'll get a, a faster return on investment. You'll prove that you know what you're doing quicker. Um, now build confidence because that's, you know, whenever, especially if you're in an environment where you don't have a lot of executive support and, you know, maybe you're going a little rogue here, um, you know, showing success is the best way to you, you hit those low hanging fruit. You get the low budget stuff, even especially today. I mean, you know, 
you can launch a Kubernetes cluster for practically nothing these days. Um, a production viable cluster. Um, you know, so, so hit those low hanging fruit. Yeah, and Mark, Mark covered most of that, but real quick, what I'll get into is this is something that's very dear to me, which was everybody always saying microservices only. And to me, uh, as Mark was saying, I'm, I'm a monolith fan coming over. So you got kind of that IVM idea. The, the biggest thing I would tell you to look out for is um, assuming it can scale, right? Because not all monoliths can scale. You can't say two replicas. I tried to spin up MySQL today and say two replicas by default, just not going to work well for you. You can set it up in other high availability, but the native. So if you can't scale past one, you will have downtime anytime that that pod has to move. Granted, hopefully it's very small amount of downtime. However, I have dealt with monolithic containers that are 18 to 20 gigs. That downtime to pull that again to another host takes time. So you could have some delays. If you can scale that replica to two, then you can almost treat it like a microservice. You're gonna have that resiliency at least. So there definitely are reasons to bring those over, but be careful with the fact of the scale. That's probably the biggest thing. Sure. <clears throat> Let's move on to our next question, uh, Mark and Scott. Um, so it's by an account called DevOps Teach. It came on YouTube. Um, so he's saying, how can we solve Kubernetes PVC volume mount after delete and recreate node? So this is where I get to play developer and just angrily scream at the cloud with my fist of rage because I've, I've run into this on, you name a platform, uh, I've run into it with EKS, AKS, uh, on-prem. Um, yeah, so th this is uh, this is what I think I'm going to throw into Scott's lap because I think Scott's probably uh, got a little more insight to this one with your storage background. Yeah, so we... This is an interesting question. So I, I don't know enough about the cluster deployment in this example. So is this like a PVC using the local provisioner like we would in kind? That's a whole different concept. If this was something using saying Portworks or Longhorn or Astra DS from NetApp or you know, pick, pick your flavor, right, of, of Kubernetes, software defined storage, um, the nodes shouldn't matter at that point. That's where I say this would be a great conversation to get more detail on. Uh, and storage is, as kind of Mark's alluding to, um, one of the more mysterious you know, places in Kubernetes for a lot of people, because uh, they were focused on stateless for so long. But I've been a big fan of having some kind of persistent volume since day one when we were deploying clusters. Uh, and at that time, it was Trident from NetApp, because it was just real easy. And back then, the CSI drivers weren't around, right? So you had to have something like that. So if that were the case and you had like a, a Portworks deploy or an Astra, um, deleting and recreating a node is, is benign operation. Assuming you have your SDS set up with replicas and you don't have just, if it's sharding that data across all the nodes with no other replicas of that data, that's a whole other problem. You're going to lose data. You know, that's just how it, it would work. So Depends on the design, but I'd be happy if somebody wanted to send that uh, on LinkedIn over to me with some context. Uh, that'd be yeah. awesome because I'm, I'm a big storage fan, as Mark kind of said. So yeah. I, I'd love to know more. Yeah, and I think great um, that you're bringing it up, Scott, because I was just about to say that um, if if you feel like if you are a person asking questions in the event, and if you feel that uh, we are not able to answer those uh, in as much detail as you would like, then please feel free to directly reach out to Mark um, or Scott on LinkedIn, and I'm sure they'll do the needful. Um, I'll quickly move on to the next question. I'm sure you guys will like this one. Um, so uh, there's a LinkedIn user, and um, they are asking, any plans to create a course based on the book? The YouTube walkthroughs are great, but a bit too long. <laughs> so what are um... your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, the uh, coursework, so the, the the coursework is tough to build. Um, I think, uh, at least personally, I know that the the um, the videos are are meant to be kind of more of a companion, not so much a a, a course. Um, and, and honestly, if we did build coursework, they'd probably end up being longer. Um, so, uh, uh, but that's good feedback. I, I was feeling like the videos are probably dragging on a bit too long. We'll, we'll make them a little bit smaller bite portions. 
um, to, to make it a little easier to consume. Yeah, and I, I so before I worked at HSBC, I was actually a, a certified trainer for Microsoft, Citrix, uh, at Novell. So there's a term, and, and always wondering who remembers what Novell was. Um, and I, I'm a big fan. I figure in America, a lot of people do. I mean, it was towards <laughs> the end of life for Novell, but it was still being taught. Um, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of that, and that's why when when Mark came up with the video idea, that's what came to my mind. Is we're almost making it a CBT. Uh, which is getting close to a course. But obviously, the, the our videos are a different story, right? We'd have to cut those up into to bite-sized chunks, like you do with uh, other other talking head videos, right? Nobody wants to sit and watch a recording for an hour. Um, you got to take it in smaller chunks. The adult attention span is ten minutes, so you don't want to go much past that um, unless you have some interaction for true life. Yeah. But I do see a huge gap in the Kubernetes training areas when it gets to that. So, although it is a lot of work, uh, it, part of my first job at Ingram Micro is I did actually do some input on courseware with Microsoft and what looks like it's easy to come up with isn't. Writing the book's a lot easier than the courseware, to be honest. <laughs> That's actually good to know because I'd usually authors say the other way around where obviously like a video is probably more uh, uh, appealing. Uh, but as you said, I think uh, Scott very rightly that if it is interactive, uh, it would probably make it uh, a lot more interesting, a lot more valuable uh, to the community. Um, I'll move on to the next question, uh, by the way. So then that's from um, T.Y. Brown on YouTube. Um, he says, I recently picked up the Docker Fundamentals and the Docker Certified Associate book. At what point in my studies should I transition to learning Kubernetes? So I have really strong opinions on this one. Now, um, get rid of those books. They're not going to do you any good in a professional setting. Um, Docker is a decent enough development tool. Um, there are still instances where I use Docker um, to kind of test things out locally. Uh, but and and you know, if, if anybody is read the first edition of the book we had what three chapters scott four chapters mm -hmm. on docker yeah and like 15 minutes after we released the book which is one of the reasons why we pushed so hard to do the second edition kind of quickly um kubernetes deprecated docker shim and basically said docker is no you know the the original docker that we all know and love that we started with in in you know 2010 2011 is no longer going to be part of the kubernetes ecosystem directly um and so, uh, yeah, I would, I would just, you know, between that and the fact that it's so easy now to get a, 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 a cluster up and running, um, you know, like I know that like me personally, the scripts that Scott wrote in the book for getting clusters up and running in kind, like that's my go-to now, especially if I don't need to worry about the persistence of the, of, you know, if I just need a disposable, um, a disposable cluster or um, Sivo is another one. I'll, I'll, you know, I love that company, you know, go up there five bucks for a week. You know, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, it's so easy. It's so cheap to create your own clusters. Now um, don't bother with Docker, go straight to Kubernetes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm with Mark to a point because I think sometimes we tend to forget that we knew Docker from five, six years ago. So we, we often look and say, oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. But we've been doing it so long. So it depends where you're coming in from, right? So I think if you've never seen a container before, it's good to go through that. But I don't think, as I think, Mark, what you'd be alluding to is you don't have to look so much at that Docker Fundamentals book and memorize it and say, okay, cool. Unless I got all of this grasp, don't move on to Kubernetes. Uh, because, of course, during Kubernetes, we're never going to talk about how you create a container. Right, we're good. That, that's covered on the Docker side or any kind of build mechanism you want. Uh, although we do parts of that, right, in a, in a chapter 14 uh, when you do provisioning a platform. But it's, um, I don't think it should delay you getting into Kubernetes, which is what I would probably go with, with where Mark was saying. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say as long as you've got that basic fundamentals and you know what a container is, you know, something like the overlay file system. Although we talk about that in our first chapter to try to give you that real high level of here's what you probably have to know to at least, well, at least run kind, right? So you know how you're at least doing that. So yeah, I would say uh, almost uh, take it in a synchronous approach. You know, keep, keep looking at Docker, but don't let that get you away from Kubernetes. Sure. 
Um, thanks, Martin uh, Scott. Um, we'll move on to the next question, which is again from YouTube. It's uh, by Kathirvel. Um, so he's asking, what is the importance of API gateway in Kubernetes and which one is best for production and open source? Um, so uh, to answer your first question, depends. Um, I mean, if, if what you're rolling out is an API system, if you're focusing on microservices, then yeah, an API gateway is going to be pretty important. Um, which one is best? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would never say which one is best because it's really going to depend on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm going to throw another one, uh, another buzzword in there with service mesh. You know, that line between service mesh and API gateway is really starting to get fuzzy. You know, there's that Venn diagram and that little overlap is getting small. You know, the, the overlap space is getting bigger and bigger. It's going to eventually become one circle probably. Um, you know, it, it's always important to, to kind of even at the beginning of the conversation when we said, you know, figure out what you're trying to accomplish. You got to figure out what you're trying to accomplish and whether or not the API gateway that you're looking towards is going to be um uh what you want to do so whether you're you know uh, uh looking at a calm or uh you know one of what i would call the more legacy api gateways uh, like wso2 or kong right and, and i call them legacy because they came out before um before kubernetes was a thing uh or you look at you know something like the solo io count as a API gateway, uh, you know, it's always a little hairy to me. What's an API gateway versus what's a service mesh these days? Um, but yeah, it, th there's a lot of options out there. Um, they're all good. Um, you know, I, I got nothing negative to say about them, you know, but th they've all got different features and, and you should really focus on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, if, if you're a enterprise user, is this a company that you want to be investing in? Um, because every vendor you have is an investment uh, to, to one degree or another. Um, you know, it, it, it's not something you have to have for Kubernetes, I would say. But it, you know, yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely don't. But this is big, obviously, at an organization where I work, right? So uh, Kong, you know, Mule, obviously a very common one. So it, it's when you talk about the importance of it, to me, they're they're mutually exclusive, really, right? So if you're going to do an API gateway, like a Kong, it, there is nothing in Kubernetes that's going to give you that by default. Like Mark said, service mesh does gray the area a bit. However, service mesh still requires an API gateway in today's world for a couple operations. API gateways are going to transform your data, right? They're, they're going to have a little bit better security, heck, even, even in Istio, right? Uh, and better logging capabilities. So API gateways are still heavily, heavily used. So my team actually in the bank is middleware. So obviously we deal with API gateways. Uh, we, we have thousands and we're all, I mean, everything going in today, if we develop our own systems, the first question is, what are the APIs to call it, right? So everything has to have one. So we're gonna use an API gateway as a layer. Like Mark said, I'm not gonna lean towards Kong, Mule, anything. Uh, Cause honestly, I think my developers can pick the best solution on that and give their feedback. Cause they're the ones that ultimately have to consume that. So we use a couple you know not like i said i won't endorse but we have a couple that we do use as well as just istio when we can sure so moving on the next question um, asks you guys that what's the best place to create a cluster to practice minikube locally or the cloud so i actually tend to avoid minikube like the plague um, and the reason it, Minikube is great if you are trying to figure out how to deploy a simple application into Kubernetes, it, it's a decent option. Um, but because it abstracts away so many of the guts, um, which are the parts that I personally tend to care about the most, um, I find that as a learning tool, it, it, it's kind of tough. Um, you know, if you are looking to, um, you know, it, it depends on where your starting point is, right? Like if you're, if you're an API developer and you want to just figure out how you can write an a, you know, a manifest that's going to run in Kubernetes, um, you know, launching it on something like Sivo would be a good way to go. Um, you know, if you are 
uh, uh, looking to um, learn how to run Kubernetes. Uh, there are a lot of single node cluster approaches. I know I maintain an Ansible script that does it um, that you can get uh, online for free. Um, and then what Scott did for Kind was amazing because you can get Kind up and running. And what most people don't realize is Kind is literally just kubeadm inside of a container for you pre-launch. So you don't have to worry about running kubeadm yourself. Um, and so, uh, yeah, with, with a little bit of trickery, which we do in the book, um, where we, we pretend that we're SSHing into VMs kind of. Um, and angering the container gods while we're at it. Um, you know, it, it, that's where I would go for, for like, you know, I, I really want to get to the guts uh, of how Kubernetes works. Yeah, and I, I would uh, kind of go with Mark as well on that. Mini Kube, I, I won't say it quite as, quite as blatant as Mark, but agreed. I, I did like it when I started, but it, it limits you and stuff. Like for ingress, you can just do your Mini Kube, create ingress, right? I mean, you don't have to do anything. Uh, and that's great, but you're not going to know how to create that Nginx ingress container. You can still do it manually, but same with dashboard, right? Minikube dashboard or whatever command it is. Um, it also is limiting on what you can kind of plug in in certain things too, whether it's the CNI uh, or anything else. So that's, that's kind of why when we wrote the first edition, we did debate, what are we going to do? Should we do vagrants and just spin up VMs and do things? Should we do Minikube? And that's when kind came about uh, when we started doing it back like 0.6 for the version. Uh, it also gives you the local provisioner for disk too. So you've got a way to play with persistent disk without having to try to spin up the NFS daemon or um, deploy a bunch of VMs or extra nodes. Now in the cloud side, there are some benefits to that. However, you, you won't see the control plane if you do a managed Kubernetes, right? But if you do just VMs, you could. The only thing I would tell you is make sure you turn it off. Um, I, I've done many types of cloud uh, education and uh, sometimes you forget till the end of the month when you get the bill and i say oh i forgot to turn that off uh and some of that can be expensive like ips if you wanted to do a vpn connection to go through so just remember to turn it off and uh <laughs> either one works so I'm, I'm a fan of both i'm actually a fan of doing hybrid you know to learn even more put a couple nodes internal and then get two on like gcp just to show how you're going across for redundancy sure um, just to be sensitive of time, um, because of the technical issues, we started this, the session a bit late. So I think we will be, um, uh, Mark and Scott, we'll, we'll try to wind up in the next 10 minutes because we have some more quest uh, questions to answer. So um, I'll move on to the next. <laughs> I'll move on to the next one. It's by Carthirwell again. Um, so he's asking, what are important key points to consider hosting enterprise application in cluster? And then the second part of the question is, what are the tools which is mandatory to install before deploying my application in the cluster? Um, so that's a great question. Um, from my perspective, the most important key points of uh, hosting enterprise applications has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with organization. Um, you know, whether you are an app owner that is responsible for managing an application, uh, or you are an infrastructure owner that is responsible for hosting that application. Uh, you know, the, the um, coming from an identity management background uh, where uh, silos are like the most important thing to have to manage. Um, I think that what you're finding with Kubernetes is that you're moving from a completely siloed environment into a shared environment and what does that shared responsibility model look like? Who's responsible for what? Um, how much responsibility are you willing to give up? Uh, and and that you know that that's like you know what's my bonus going to be based on uptime, right? Like w w that's how organizational you need to get. Um, and so when it comes time to say, okay, we're going to move our application to Kubernetes, you know. Are you going to uh, uh, go with a shared Kubernetes service? Are you going to try to do it yourself? Um, you know, if you try to do it yourself, what happens when it breaks? You know, it's easy to deploy a cluster. Fixing one, oh, that that's anybody who's watched uh, cluster uh, was it cluster D cluster clustered? Um, um, you know, uh, 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 
and and what you have to do to figure out how to fix a car that's hard um and so so that that to me is the most important part is is don't you know make sure to look at the organizational impacts of, of moving to kubernetes um and then mandatory tools to deploy uh, you know i'm not big on mandatory tools um you do the tool that that works best for you uh find the tool that works right for you you know you don't you don't have to use hell you don't have to use json it you don't have to use Prometheus, you are not a bad person if you choose not to use these <laughs> tools. Um, you know, not every tool, you know, you don't use a screwdriver to drive in a nail. You don't use a hammer to drive in a screw because you don't have a screwdriver. Um, so you, you find the tool that works best for you. Yeah, yeah, and I would agree with Mark on that. I mean, obviously, from, from an enterprise standpoint, uh, there are certain tools. And when I say tools, more of an overarching, right? Like Mark said, I'm not going to say that your logging tool or your metrics has to be Prometheus or it has to be Kibana or, you know, whatever, Splunk, Datadog, Sysdig, but you definitely want something for logging um, without a doubt. And of course your metrics and especially that, you know, near and dear to me is on-prem. So I have to make sure my resources are there because if I'm going to have to order more hardware, I need to know way before I need to order it. Because we all know any kind of enterprise takes time to get stuff done, whether it's approvals, for, for the funding, whether it's the shipping, whether it's the building. And, and as Mark said, uh, team synergy is, is big. You know, the silos of enterprises are very damaging in a world of like Kubernetes because these, you have to integrate with everybody. So storage is a prime example. If I'm running port works and I'm going to consume something on the back end, like uh, a pure storage array, you know, since they bought port works, um, the storage team has to integrate pretty heavily with me. And certain things are only cluster level operations, right? There might be a, a CRD creation that they're not gonna be able to do because they're not the cluster owners. So you have to get the, the communication. You know, you need to follow the agile methodology of having your pod, not Kubernetes pod, right? So this is the agile type pod. Um, security, right? How many Kubernetes out of the box actually lock out stuff like privileged containers, host path, host IPCs, um, it's all damaging. You know, uh, the size of your nodes. There's there's so many things that we've learned and we have, anybody that said they've run Kubernetes for two or three years that says they haven't had the scars and the bruises to prove how much they've been beat on is probably just lying, to be honest. We've all had it. So you, you, you'll you evolve on that. But something like privilege, I mean, I, I say one thing that has to be on every cluster is something like an admission controller like Gatekeeper or OPA. Uh, there's just... Mm -hmm too many things that can go wrong. Forget about security, ingress rules. You don't want somebody stomping on somebody else's ingress rule. Hell, even worse, you don't want them stomping on the API ingress, for an example, because they grab that IP. A lot of things that you gotta think about. Uh, there were a lot of terms in the old days that day two is where people were putting security, logging, monitoring, and that is just the scariest statement in the enterprise, right? That thing's live, and day two is your security. There's just, I'm probably giving Mark, you know, seizures with this because day two is not security, right? Security is at day one and it should be everybody. So um, what's great is there's papers now, right? Government papers coming out now about how you should at least base secure a cluster. It doesn't have everything. Mark and I have already called out a couple of things in that doc that I'm like, oh, how do they miss this? But it covers the beginning of it. Yeah, sounds good. Um... I'm gonna pop up another question from Charles again. Um, so I think he asked a question earlier, which we didn't take. Um, so uh, it, he, he's basically asking now that managed solutions like VMware Tanzu, is there another option on premises you approve of? Um, I mean, I'm not gonna say I approve of any of them. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, I think a lot of it comes down to what works for your organization. Um, so like Tanzu is an example. You know, if, if you got a lot of VMware, Tanzu might be a good approach. Um, you know, it might be easier to buy, right? Like you might just be able to get it or turn it on or turn on some of it. Um, you know, it, the differentiators between the different on-prem Kubernetes um, 
I don't think are so high that on a purely technical level, you can look at, you know, one versus the other and say, oh, that's the better one. Um, you know, I, I would say kind of the one exception there is, is OpenShift uh, because OpenShift was created before Kubernetes had a lot of the features that OpenShift has. And so um, it becomes uh, one of those things where, okay, um, do I want to go with OpenShift? And and I'm I'm an absolute I'm a I'm a Red Hat fanboy. I will I will not make any qualms about it. I think what they did with OpenShift was great. Um, the or what they accomplished with OpenShift was great. Um, the uh, but you know there's a, a, a what some might call lock in. I would call investment. Or I'm investing in this. Um, or do you go with like uh, OpenShift and say you know what we're going to use OpenShift. But we're not going to let anybody know it's OpenShift and make everybody use it as if it's regular Kubernetes. I've seen a lot of organizations do that, um, which seems a little silly to me, but hey, you do you. Um, you know, it, it, it really comes down to much more of, you know, which organizations are you best working with? Which ones do you like better? Um, the one thing I will pretty much always recommend against for any production cluster is Kubedia. They're, it's a great learning tool. Um, but it, it's just that it, it's not, uh, you know, deploying it's easy, fixing it, God help us. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, I, we went through a bunch of this, right. For on-prem. So we, we've evaluated a ton of vendors going down the line and it's not a secret. I can say what we use because it's, it, I've been at. Google Next with this. There's blogs on Google site. We're an Anthos on-prem uh, focus. I mean, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nodes. So why, why did we select something like that? Well, we've got a partnership, obviously, with Google on the cloud side. Um, we, I, they're an engineering company, so we like that idea. And we're heavily involved with the advancement of Anthos in general. And that's not to say that I think it's good for everybody. But when you leverage all the components in it, like for an example, coming with Istio, you know, ASM in their example, um, it's a supported Istio. So it's great you get that out of the box. I realize Tanzu too, as well, the Tanzu service mesh. Um, and, and nothing wrong with the Tanzu service mesh, it's a great tool. And I was DMware for 15 years um, at the bank. So it, it's great, but they also mask a lot of the Istio stuff by default. So we have to worry as a big organization about back out. So if one of our relationships goes under for any, any reason, right? It could be the vendor, it could be contracts, they go out of business. The regulators want to know, how am I going to get back into business quickly? Because you can't have one of the world's largest banks just saying, oh, I can't do that today because Amazon closed shop, you know, Google closed shop, whatever it could be, uh, or a contract dispute. And they said, we have to uninstall everything tomorrow. Okay, so we have to consider that. Um, it's, I would just say, worry about support, right? And, and that's where the partnerships come in. I think where Mark was yeah. alluding. So, because when it breaks, man, I, I've had to call places, right? I mean, I fixed a lot of clusters, but there are those times where I just look and go, I have no idea right now. And then you get the vendor on and they'll look and go, I don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, oh, good, it's not just me. <laughs> but, you know, when they can get the coders, that's where that really comes in. Get me those engineers that design this so we can figure out what the problem is. You're going to pay for that, right? There, it, it's just part of it, whether it's OpenShift, whether it's going to be, uh, you know, EKS anywhere. If you're going to go mm -hmm. with Amazon or you're going to go with Anthos. You're going to go with Rancher. It's, it's designing it correct. What looks expensive hopefully isn't, meaning mm -hmm. you can justify the cost savings and the, the agility you're going to get to say, yes, this couple million dollar investment could save us 60% in resources. You know, just using my big example, and you can easily offset that on the books, at least to say on paper that cool, it's an investment now in three years, it should be returning a lot more. Yeah. Um, cool, guys. I think I'm going to ask one last question uh, before um, we um, bid farewell. Um, so um, there's so one thing which I obviously wanted to know and which I'm very keen to know about is that what does the future hold for Kubernetes? Because it's obviously an ecosystem which is becoming bigger as we speak. 
Um, that's one. And then uh, in the context of the book, we had somebody asking that, are there any thoughts of adding a chapter on crossplay, which I'm assuming the reader is referring to the next edition of your enterprise guide. Um, so yeah, can we um, can we discuss these things? And um, as I said, we'll conclude the session then. Sure. So um, as for the future of Kubernetes, uh, I, and you're starting to see this now, where Kubernetes is going to move out of a cluster management API and more to a data center API. Uh-oh, my monitor just went nuts. Um, and so uh, the you're going and you're starting to see this now, where um, you know there are, for instance, operators that let you create uh, cloud resources using the Kubernetes API. Um, it, it's gotten to that point of extensibility. Uh, you're also going to see more um, from the security standpoint of uh, zero trust uh, to get really buzzwordy, um, where the identity that your Kubernetes pods have are going to interact with other services using that identity. Uh, and so it'll become more of a, a data center orchestration system than just a container orchestration system. Not that container orchestration is just. Um, but I, I think you're going to see it move beyond that. Um, and then what's going to go in future book uh, editions of the book, um, like Crossplane. I don't know about Crossplane in particular. I don't have a ton of experience with it, so I probably would be hesitant to add it. Um, you know, uh, for me, some of the things that I'd like to explore uh, in future editions of the book, getting into um, secrets management. We don't really do a lot with secrets management in the, the second edition. Um, I would love to add that. Um, I'd like to explore uh, using Gatekeeper and OPA as more of an application authorization system. We kind of touch on it a little bit and what some of those challenges are, um, but that's something that people are, are really starting to want to do. Um, and then, uh, you know, continuing to expand on the GitOps platform. Um, as the tools for GitOps become bigger and, and more powerful and able to do more, being able to expand on that. So like in the first edition, um, we didn't include any uh, container policy in the GitOps platform that we built out in chapter 14. Uh, in the second edition, we added Gatekeeper to it so that we were not only automating the rollout of the GitOps side, but we were automating the compliance side when it came to uh, um, Gatekeeper. Um, so those, those are kind of the places that I'd love to go uh, in future editions. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, so the cross-plane question in particular is an interesting topic. Um, the only problem with putting that into the book is going to be, since it does kind of uh, go across clouds and everything else, it, it, it's, it's tougher for exercises, right? And, and we could add it as an advanced topic. And this is where we start getting into that. We're trying to make sure what we can teach within limits um, can be done by most people without saying, you know, somebody reading a chapter saying, oh man, I'm going to have to go to AWS, GCP, Azure, Alley, something on-prem, I need, wait, I need eight VMs, I got to go buy some RAM. And many of us probably have this, right, depending on what you do, but people starting out may not. So we're trying to be careful with that. I think we're going to have to breach that at some point to say, okay, maybe there will be a chapter that's just theory. And you might notice looking at the book, we try to stay away from that, right? We want to go theory, some exercising, some theory, some exercising. This way, it doesn't feel like it's a chore to read the book. Yeah. You know, we've all read books where there's 60 pages of nothing but text. You get to page 38 and you're flipping going, oh, I got 30 more left. And, <laughs> you know, you're trying to get through it. And that's not good for the mindset, right? Yeah. And like Mark said, the next one, I think I want to get into virtual clusters, for an example, because that's becoming a big topic. Uh, and I see that's where Kubernetes is going is like Mark said, data center management. I've been saying that for a while as well. Uh, you'll see that managing VMs in your Kubernetes resources is huge. Obviously, Tanzu can do this. Uh, Anthos does this. Uh, you can, you know, using Kubevert. So you, you can see, now of course, that's where you can see these silos now getting even more difficult because you'll have virtualization teams, you'll have super stack teams that maintain things. And instead of thinking that, oh, wow, my job's going away. It's not, it's shifting. You may not go into virtual center to do something now, but you still have to have that background of what a hypervisor is, how it works, how to tune it potentially. So it's just transitioning roles. You know, it's, it's, it's the same type of role, just 
eh, slightly different. And yeah, your, your team name not, might not be the virtualization team anymore. You're now the cloud team, hybrid cloud team, internal cloud team, whatever you want to call yourselves. So yeah, you can see it. Kubernetes just the way it's expanding the API, you know, manage your storage, manage your network, do your plugins. Uh, it, it's a great tool. And, and why have nine different API calls for something? Let's try mm -hmm. to put them into one central spot that's controlled by security, right? So now we've got our security model built in there so we can leverage the JOT tokens or whatever else you're authenticating. Sure. Thank you so much, Mark and Scott. Um, I think uh, we'll conclude the session right now. Um, some great questions. Um, I think um, we've covered so much ground in terms of what you have shared, in terms of the knowledge uh, that you've obviously shared with the community. Um, we still need to pick two winners who would win a free copy of Kubernetes and Enterprise Guide second edition. So based on the quality of questions asked, let's do that after the event. Um, I'll announce the winners on LinkedIn, um, guys. So if you have one, I will directly be reaching out to you and uh, definitely sharing the book with you very soon. Um, so once again, uh, thank you so much, Mark and Scott. Uh, it was great uh, hosting you both. And uh, um, keep sharing information as much as possible. I think the readers obviously love it. Um, and I'll keep in touch. We'll speak soon. Yeah. That's great. I, I appreciate the time from everybody that took their time to come in and, and ask the questions. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.